All right, so I would say let's continue and have a look at the model output so I can share my screen again. So I, I just checked and my model is also still running. So don't, so my, so it's almost done, but it's still running. So don't worry if your model hasn't completed. As we already mentioned, you can still look at your model output even if the model is running. And some other nice feature of Paraview is that if you sort of, if you click on the solution file that you're looking at and then click on F, like hit F5, then it will also update the output with all of the new files that have been written in the meantime. So you can like apply a number of different filters in Paraview and then like if the model is still running, you can then reload new files. And so we already looked at the initial temperature in the model. Um, and we can also look at the model evolution. So let me click on play just to see what happens. And basically what we see is, well, we, we know the left side is the rich axis. We know the plate velocity is prescribed towards the right as a top boundary condition. And so what we have for the temperature is we have like a really, so we have the mid ocean ridge at the left and then we have an increasing plate thickness if we go towards the right. And so now of course, oh, let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, and of course, what we're now really interested in is we want to see like what happens to the melt in the model. So what we can do is we can change this representation here from temperature to porosity. And so let me just note that there are two different things. There are like melt fraction and porosity. And melt fraction is the equilibrium melt fraction that the melting model predicts and porosity is the, the melt that's really present in the model. So what we want to look at is the porosity. And yeah, let me, let me go back to the start of the model. So in the beginning, there is no melt at all. And then if we uh, start running this model, so let me, let me just stop here a little bit and go back. So one, one nice thing that you can also do in Paraview, if you click on view and then animation view, you get this, uh, you get this panel here at the bottom and there you can basically go, go like it's easy to, like go between the different time steps and make the sort of make the anim animations run slower or faster. And so what we see is that as, um, so that's at the same time as the temperature in the left part of the model increases because we have this upwards flow, um, this blob of melt starts to form here. And then um, sort of a, a, a lot of melt is generated at the ridge axis. But if we go then to later time steps, we reach some sort of steady state where we have basically melt everywhere in the domain, like so above a given depth, which is where the solidus is and material starts to melt. Um, and then we have a lot of melt at the, at the ridge axis. And then this top boundary here is where the temperature gets too cold and melt starts to freeze again. And now maybe we are also interested in where the melt is flowing to. So one thing we can use to look at that is this, uh, is this glyph filter that we already mentioned. Um, so I, I, I don't quite recall if we used it previously, but if we click on glyph, then in this panel here, in this properties panel to the left, we get a number of different options that we can, uh, that we can choose for like what we want to visualize. And in this case, we want to look at the melt velocity. Um, so if we click on this, uh, on the, panel next to vectors. Uh, there are two output vectors in the model. One is the velocity, which is the solid velocity, and the other one is called UF. And that's the one we want. That's the melt velocity. So we want to visualize this UF. And so one thing I think you have to do in this version of Paraview is change the glyph mode from uniform spatial distribution to every nth point, and then change the stride to something like 20. Um, and I think that's just like specific, like some versions of Paraview, uh, they like the, the other option doesn't work. And in principle, that should already be enough. So you change, uh, to go back, you change this, uh, the vectors to U underscore F and you change the glyph mode to every nth point and the stride to 20. And then you can click on apply and that will show the melt velocity. And now we have the same color scale for the melt velocity as yes, these arrow, arrows and the, the background color. So that's probably not what we want. So 
first we probably want to show these arrows if we actually want them to show the melt velocity and not the porosity. So we can go to the panel here at the top and instead of porosity, select UF. And then it will show us also where the melt velocity is the biggest, not only the direction of the flow. And we probably want to change the color to something else. So we can click on edit color map. And if we, if we click on, on the symbol here, it will open the panel on the right. And there we can change what color scale we want to use. So there was also a question yesterday, like why, why do your colors look so different? So the way to choose the color scale is click on this folder with the little heart here, choose preset. And then it will open a window with different color scales. And so then we can say, I don't know, we want to have this color scale, like just, just to make sure we have some other color scale for the melt velocity so that we can see what happens. Um, yeah, maybe maybe not not such a great choice. Let me pick something else that's easier to see. Yeah, maybe this is better. So, and now I mean we can uh, sort of the different options here allow us to still change like the size of these arrows, and uh, we can also scale them with the velocity. But basically, what we see is, um, well, where does the melt flow? There's sort of if the melt is generated too far away from the mid-ocean ridge, it will sort of move with the plate velocity and will move away from the ridge. If it's formed closer towards the mid-ocean ridge, um, then it will, well, I guess it's harder to see. Maybe I can zoom this in here. Uh, you can see that there are some of these velocity arrows that sort of go towards the ridge axis. Um, let me make them. Um, make, let me rescale these arrows so that they're a little bit smaller. So they're under scaling. There is the scale factor where you can change the size of the arrows. So maybe that's a little bit easier to see. So basically, we have this region that I already pointed out in the slide about the resolution, where there's this sort of all of the blue, the, the blue part of the model up here, that's the lithosphere where it's cold. So if I, if I switch and the solution.pvd, if I switch the representation from porosity to temperature, we see that this is basically where the lower temperatures would be. And that's where, where material is freezing again. Uh, and below that channel, uh, below that cold materials or below the lithosphere, we have uh, sort of the, the porosity shows this, this channel of flow, the melt flows towards the ridge axis. And so what we also see is basically in uh, at the ridge axis, melt starts to freeze again. And so what we should be able to do is like not just look at the flow of melt, but we should also be able to see, well, what's the change in composition? Like we should generate a sort of like crust at the mid-ocean ridge, and we should have a lithosphere below, and the, um, and the crust should be like enriched, and the lithosphere should be depleted. So, and the variable that shows this is this peridotite field that tracks like how much melt has been extracted from a given region. So if I like disable this the visibility of this glyph and we go to the solution.pvd and then change the representation from temperature to peridotite, which is the field that we use to track the depletion of the material. So we see this is not quite in steady state. Well, I guess first because I'm not at the end of the model run. Um, so this is this is how far I got with my model. So I'm almost at these eight million years. Um, so it's like there's still. Well, let me click on play to see what happens. So in the uh, well, let me first probably change the color scale because sort of to explain what that field shows is it's basically if the numbers are positive, then it should be depleted material. So it's material where melt has been taken out. And if the numbers are negative, so if the colors are blue, then it's enriched material. So that's where frozen melt has moved somewhere. So melt has moved somewhere else. It has it froze and then made something that's something like the crust. And so what we want to do is we want to change the color scale so that zero is in the center of the color scale, um, which is not the case at the moment. So we want to change the color scale to maybe something like minus 0.15 to plus 0.115 so that it's symmetric around zero. And oh, well, let me show again how I did that. So you, if you click on rescale to custom data range, that's up here. So the, the fourth 
panel from the left, the one with the little C. If you click on that, then you get to that window where you can put in the minimum number for the color scale and the maximum number for the color scale. And then if you put in minus 0.15 and 0.15 and click on rescale and disable automatic rescaling, then it will just keep that for like, well, until you look at it, like until you start Paraview again, I guess. And so now you can see if I go back to the initial uh, initial condition of the model, we said, well, we start without any enrichment or depletion. At the beginning, it's just like uh, the, the value is zero. It's not depleted or enriched. And then if we start the model, we see that like this was this blob where a lot of melt was generated. And so, um, and then the melt moves upwards because it's less dense than the solid. So we see every part of the model where melt has been generated and the melt moved away, that's now depleted. And then there's this blue part here, which means melt has moved upwards and then has, has reached a cold region and flows in again. And so that's the part that's enriched. And sort of the, these colors become even extreme as the, uh, even more extreme as the model evolves. Um, and so we see that at some point we reach a sort of, of steady state for the mid-ocean ridge. They're basically, so like this, uh, this is the mantle where the melt is extracted and this is the newly formed crust and then everything. Uh, so after all of the melt freezes, all of this material just as a plate moves towards the right and it has this enriched crust on top and it has the depleted lithosphere below. And we can also have a look at sort of how thick is the crust and how thick is the lithosphere. And one tool that I find useful in Paraview for how to do that is called plot over line. And I think we haven't used it before. So let me also show how to do that. Um, I will close this color map editor again. And then the plot over line tool, uh, that's the one located right here. So it's this uh, green rectangle with this uh, line in there. And so if you click on that, um, well, first you will see where it will make the line that you want to, uh, where you want to sort of like look at the plot. And in the property window here in the left, you can change where this line should be. So um, basically these line parameters, they give you point one and point two, which are the start point and the end point of the line. And what we want to do is basically look almost all the way to the right. So if you want to look at a profile, like a vertical profile across the plate to see, well, how thick is the crust and how thick is the lithosphere. So, um, so the coordinate system is in a way that zero, zero is here at the bottom, like the point where x equals zero, y equals zero. And then we have like 105 kilometers in x direction and 70 kilometers in y direction. So let's change this. Uh, so let's change this something to um, maybe change the x coordinate for both of these uh, both of these points to 90 kilometers. So that means we leave the y coordinates as they are um, from the bottom of the model to the top of the model. But then these first two uh, entries, we change them both to 90,000. So 90 kilometers from the ridge axis. Um, and then you also see in this window here, that's where it will make the line. So um, yeah, it will, it will show the position. And so once you've changed these numbers here, so change both the first panels to 90, you can click, off, uh, click on apply. And that will make a new window and paraview that shows like all of the material properties in the model along that line. And well, that doesn't really help us that much because we, we don't really see anything except for the viscosity, which has the biggest value. So you, we want to select our the, the field that we're interested in, this this prototype field, the depletion. And so if you have selected this plot over line here in the pipeline browser, you can scroll down until you reach this window that's called uh, serious parameters. And then if you just click on variable, it will uncheck all of the different variables that are visible. So then now we here, we don't see anything anymore. And then the only thing we want to see is this prototype. So this is what we want to plot. So we just click on this one box here that shows prototype. And so the way to think about this here is now that the left side is the bottom of the model and the right side is the top of the model. Um, so the, the horizontal axis here in that plot, that's what the, what's the vertical axis in our model. 
and the vertical axis here that shows us the depletion. So we can, um, so this plot tells us where material is enriched and where it's depleted and the crossover is at zero. So we can basically go to this point and say, oh, where do we change from being enriched, which would define the crust to being depleted, which should define a lithosphere. And so here it's something like an uh, sort of a, a Y coordinate of something like a bit more than 60,000. So it's almost uh, something like 61 kilometers from the bottom of the model. And we remember our model was 70 kilometers high. So in this case, the crust is something like nine kilometers thick. Um, and this is something that's useful to compare our model to observations because we know the crust of thickness should be something like six to seven kilometers. And so um, um, what we can do now is we can play around with different parameters to basically say, well, how does the crust of thickness change on these different parameters in our model and which one will give us like a realistic solution. So that's, that was why I wanted to show this just to, uh, just to say like, this is one thing for how like, for one observation for what to look for in a magma dynamics model. Uh, Juliana, before you move on, we had one question in the chat and that is, um, how can we think of these numbers for periodicity? Do they, do they have a special meaning? Can we, um, does it range from minus one to plus one or does it mean anything? So one way to think about it is it's sort of the percentage of melt that has been extracted from one spot and like that, that moved to the other spot and then frozen in there. So if it's, if it's red, so if the colors are above zero um, and if they are like 0.15, so if they are 0.15 in this spot, then that means 15% of material has been molten and has been taken away somewhere else. Um, and if they are something like minus, uh, minus 0.15 somewhere here, that means 15% of melt from somewhere else has moved to that spot and has frozen in there. So it, so it, in some way it relates to the composition of the material, but because the, the melting model doesn't give us like something like major element compositions, um, it's not exactly the composition. It's just sort of a measure for how much melt has been extracted from one point and then has frozen in at some other point. Okay, thank you. All right. So, yeah, and I, um, that was basically what, it, what I wanted to say about like looking at the model results. And I know there have been a lot of questions about like what, what do the equations look like and what, what do the, these parameters mean? So I also want to talk about this. So um, let me scroll through all of those slides because we, we looked at all of that. So now I want to talk a little bit more about magma dynamics in general. So like what are even these equations that we look at? What do these different parameters do? And so we already said, well, the problem that we look at is we have a, a model that has some partially molten region and there is some melt present in that region and we define the sort of, we, we have a volume fraction of melt that's present at every point in time. And that's what I will call phi, the porosity. So in the equations that will have the symbol phi. And then in that partially molten region, the melt will generally move with a different velocity than the solid. And so we have now two different velocities in our model instead of just one. And I will give them different indices. So the melt velocity has the index uf and the solid velocity has the index us. And then we also said, well, we have different material properties in addition to the ones that we have for like solid matter convection models. And one example is the, the permeability, which I will talk about. And the other example is we have a new type of viscosity. And also in, in just like the half an hour that we have left, I cannot say everything about like how magma dynamics works. And so because of that on like, I've put some more resources onto my slides. So there are some really good introductions on like what are the different types of behaviors you have in these magma dynamics models. Um, one is this, uh, uh, this, yeah, I think that's like an introduction that, that Mark Spiegelman and Richard Katz and uh, other people did uh, that's online. And the other one is like, this is a lecture from Richard Katz and that are like really long, like, I don't know, like several tens of pages of lecture notes. And those are really good to look at like 
how do the equations look like, um, what are the different behaviors that, that these equations predict, and so on. And I just want to um, explain some of the material properties. Um, one of the properties that I now mentioned a lot that's important for magma dynamics is the permeability. And what the permeability is, it basically, um, so if we think about melting and magma dynamics, what, what happens is that, um, so we first have a solid rock and when it starts to melt, then the melt forms between the grain boundaries of the solid rock. Um, and what these images show here on the left, these are actual images that people have taken of rocks that started to melt. So everything that's transparent is solid rock and everything that's gray are pockets of melt at the grain boundaries. Um, and so these, uh, the, the red colors are the interiors of these melt channels. And these are different images at like 2% melt and 20% melt. And now the question for the motion of melt is, well, how much are these like, or how, how are these channels connected? The better these channels are connected, the easier it is for the melt to flow and the faster the melt can flow. And one thing, so that's what's shown here on the right, that's the interconnectivity of these melt channels. And what we can see is that already at 2% of melt, basically most of these melt channels are connected. So even at small fractions of melt, melt can basically flow through the rock. It's not isolated pockets of melt where the melt would be stuck. What we can also see is that for like bigger fractions of melt, the connectivity is also much, much better. Um, so that's down here for 20% of melt. So these connections are much thicker. And generally what's assumed is that this permeability depends on the porosity. And it, um, so what I've used here is uh, the permeability depends on the porosity to the power of three. Um, generally what's said is it should be the porosity to the power of something between two and three. Um, so that's one of these nonlinear dependencies that I talked about. So this permeability is part of the momentum equation. So it's part of the mechanical part of the system, but the porosity is part of the advection system. Um, and, and I will talk about the, the equations in a little bit. Uh, one thing that I want to show now is we can have a look at how the permeability changes our model results. And don't worry if, uh, if your model hasn't finished. Um, one thing that I want to show is now how to restart a computation and so even if your model hasn't finished running for the 8 million years, I've already made a, a sort of a checkpoint where I use this checkpointing feature of aspect to create these checkpoints that you can restart the computation from. And I've added that to the repository. So you can use that computation that I ran on the virtual machine before and can restart from that state. Um, and just one, so, uh, one short note about this, usually you cannot transfer these checkpoints between different computers just because they have like different architectures, they may have different versions of the different libraries installed and so on. Um, but because we all use the same virtual machine, we basically all have the same system and the same libraries for uh, that aspect uses. And so because of that, um, that should work. And so what we want to do now is we want to restart the computation from that last time step just with a different permeability. And uh, we want to use this file that's, uh, that's called restart.prm in the same directory. And so if we just go back to the virtual machine, to our file browser, where we had the different files. So we opened, um, well, so, so in case you closed it again, uh, well, in case, in case you closed the file browser, let me open it again and show how you, how you get to that part again. So we were in aspect tutorials. And then in 2020, tectonics modeling tutorial, and then in the folder session four. And what we looked at before was this midocean ridge.prm. And what we want to look at now is this restart.prm. So if we just open that, um, this is basically the same file as the model that we just ran. And um, Basically, uh, one of the big differences is that what I've changed here is I've set this resume computation to true instead of false. So that means we will resume from a, a checkpoint. And I've also changed the output directory from midocean rich, which it was before, to rich underscore restart, which is where I've put in the checkpoint files that will allow you to restart the computation. And then the only other change I've made, the, so if we go back to the other file, all the way at the bottom, it had this uh, the syntax for writing out the checkpoints, where I said, well, at the end of the model run, 
I want to write a checkpoint. So that's what this last line here says. And I've just removed that from the restart.prm because we don't want to overwrite that checkpoint that's in the repository. And so those are the only changes I've made and everything else should be um, as, in the, as in the original model. And what we want to change now is we want to change the permeability. And we want to see like what happens if we change the permeability in the material model. So if we scroll down to the section that's labeled melting and freezing, um, and then the first, like the first thing that happens in that section is in subsection material model, um, in this melt simple model, we set the reference permeability. And so uh, what this reference permeability does is like this is the constant, and then this is multiplied by the porosity and then to the power of three. And so like this sort of sets, sets the base value and then in addition, it also depends on the porosity. And what we want to do here now is we want to change this, uh, the space value. We basically want to make the permeability bigger by one order of magnitude. So we change it from one to the minus eight to one to the minus seven and then save the file. So while well, I just hit control S uh, or you can also click on file and save. And then we can restart the model and uh, look at what happens. Well, and the, well, the other thing I didn't mention that I also changed is the end time of the model. So um, just to show that I set the end time a little bit bigger than what we had before, otherwise the model wouldn't continue to run. So I will scroll back down so that you see what the line was that we wanted to change. So we changed the reference permeability from one to the minus eight to one to the minus seven. And then we can run the model again. So let me open my terminal again and I can move it here to the right so that you can still see the input file. And so what we want to do is we want to run aspect again, but instead of running this midoceanrich.prm file, we want to run the restart.prm file. So well, I guess this is not optimal because you don't see the, the slide anymore. But basically, this is the command we want to uh, we want to basically do exactly the same as we did before. Just instead of midoceanrich.prm, we do restart.prn. And so, let me start that model. Um, you will notice that if the, like the first thing that the output is, if I scroll the, all the way to the top, the first thing it says it's resuming from snapshot. So it restarts from that snapshot that's in the rich restart folder. And so now we can let that model run a little bit and see like uh, what actually happens if we change the permeability. So let's go back to Paraview and see how that, um, how that changed the model output. Well, all of my zoom controls are over the, ha, ah, I found it. Okay, so well, we can we can close this plot over line window, and so well if we still have the the old model in here, um, so we can look at oh well and we, uh, yeah so we can look at what we would expect is we looked at well the permeability it influences how how well the melt channels are connected and so we would expect well that influences how fast the melt can move, and. So we probably want to look at the melt velocity. Uh, well, should look at the melt, the melt velocity and not just the solid velocity. So we changed the prop in the property window, we changed the property to UF. And then we want to load in this new file that we are uh, currently running. So we can load that in addition to the, uh, to the original file we have. So we again, click on this open button. And then now the output is not written in the mid ocean rich folder, but we have to like navigate up to the folder above. And then it's in this rich restart folder because we changed the name of the output directory. So if we go into rich restart, oh, well, I guess for me, it hasn't actually written any output yet. So I have to wait a while until I can load it in. So let me check my terminal. So I guess I can 
Yeah, so let, let me wait a little bit because that means for you, you probably also don't have any output yet. Uh, so then let me continue a little bit in my slides and then afterwards we can see at what, what actually happens if we change the permeability. Or, well, well, I guess for me, I just wrote the output. So, um, well, I can, yeah, I guess I can show you later because then you can sort of, uh, we can all do it together and I will continue with my slides. All right, so I, I guess as we only have 20 minutes left, I also had some, uh, some other thing we wanted to try, but let me next talk about the equations. So Renee told me that was one of the questions that already came up was like, well, I had all the, like all the time I talked about, like we solved the equations for mathematical dynamics, but I haven't actually said, well, what are these equations? And so what, I sh what I'm showing here on that slide, those are the equations that we would solve if we just have a mantle convection model. So we have a mass conservation equation. So in this case, I've, I've picked the compressible version of the equations that basically says, well, um, the, the change of mass in a given volume depends on the in and outflow of mass, but the mass should be conserved. And then we have the, the momentum conservation, which in our case is basically a force balance that says buoyancy drives the flow. And then we have uh, shear sort of friction forces and we have the pressure gradient. And we also have to solve an energy conservation equation that tells us what the temperature is. Now, if we solve the equations for mechanical dynamics, then they will look like this. So we now have two mass conservation equations. We have one for the fluid. So everything, so, so for the melt, everything that's relating, that's related to the melt, I've um, marked here with this index F. So rho is the density. And if it's rho F, it's the melt density. And we also again see this phi, which is the porosity, the volume fraction of melt. And so we now have two equations for mass conservation. We want to conserve the mass of the melt we also want to conserve the mass of the solid. And there can be reactions between those two. So this gamma says, well, if we melt material, we subtract that mass from the solid and we add that mass to the melt. So that's this, this gamma and that's why it has different signs. We now also have two momentum conservation equations. Um, we have one for the melt and one for the solid. The one for the melt is called Darcy's law. And so, yeah, let me, uh, so I, I explain that on the, on the next slide. So these are the same equations again. Darcy's law, what it does is it basically relates the difference between the melt velocity and the solid velocity um, to the material properties. And then says this uh, velocity difference depends on the permeability. So this KD here, that's the permeability divided by the melt viscosity. And it also depends on the pressure gradients in the melt. And the other thing you notice is that for the, uh, for the force balance for the solid, uh, we now have another term that wasn't there before. Um, so we had these uh, viscous shear stresses, but in addition to being sheared, the material can now also be compacted. So the way to think about that is like usually what we, like the, the forces that we include is, there is a resistance to the deformation of the material by shear forces. But now that there is melt in the pores between the solid rock. What needs to happen is if the sort of, if melt wants to flow into a region where there is no melt, then the solid rock has to expand so that there are these pores between the, the mineral grains where the melt can flow in. Um, and if the rock is sort of like pushed together and squeezed, then it will like squeeze out the melt from the pores of the rock and these pores will close. So there is also volume change in addition to the shear motion. And because of that, we have this, this other property that's called the bulk viscosity that covers the resistance of the material to that, um, to that volume deformation. And so we said, okay, um, we also need an energy conservation equation. That's, that's, uh, so we still need that. It will just look a little bit differently. Um, and then sort of, yeah, we um, sort of th these equations will also um, sort of, but th this equation just says, uh, like this just shows how we internally keep track of uh, where the melt goes. So we, we reformulate these equations up here so that one of the equations is an advection equation for the melt. Um, and so I've, I won't talk like, so if you want to know how that exactly happens in the code, I can talk about it in the discussion, but I won't talk about it much here. <laughs> 
Um, one other thing I wanted to show, which I thought is, is kind of interesting because these melt equations are so much more complicated than the mental convection equations is, um, we can look at the different forces in the equations and see at what they do and what happens to the motion of melt. So if we, if we go back to this slide, we said we had two different momentum conservation equations, one for the melt and one for the solid. And this gradient of the fluid pressure that shows up in both of the equations. So what we can do is we can reformulate this equation up here. We can rearrange it so that we have the fluid pressure on the left hand side and then we just like replace the fluid pressure in, in this equation and combine those two equations. And then we can get an equation that looks like this. And so here I've labeled all of the different forces, basically what they are. Um, and the, the different forces in the equation are, we have a buoyancy force that drives the flow and then we have different resisting, like uh, different forces that resist the flow. Um, and this is the sort of the viscous shear forces. These are like the, the normal friction forces we have for mental convection. We said we have these friction forces now also for, for the compaction, so for volume changes in the rock. Um, and then the other force that we have is called Darcy drag. And so one way to think about that is the melt has to flow through the pores of the solid rock. And there's also some friction at the boundaries between the mineral grains and the melt. And so because of that, the Darcy drag, it depends on the viscosity of the melt. So the lower viscosity of the melt, the lower this drag is, so it's easier for the melt to flow through. It depends on the permeability K. So a bigger permeability also makes the Darcy drag smaller because it's easier for the melt to flow through. And it depends on the velocity difference between the melt and the solid. So the faster the melt flows with respect to the solid, the bigger this drag at the boundaries of the melt channels is. And um, yeah, and, and this one I talked about, these are the compaction forces, sort of that's the resistance to volume changes of the melt. And the balance of these different forces, um, that's what determines what will happen in the model and how the melt flows. And one is interesting thing is to look at, well, what happens in the limit of one of these forces being really small. Um, so what will always be there is the buoyancy because that's needed to drive the flow. So in this case, it's formulated in terms of the density difference between the melt and the solid. So the melt is less dense, so it will always move upwards. But then the question is, which of these forces limits the flow? And one scenario is, well, the um, the viscous compaction forces are small and the, and the Darcy drag is important. And so then those two terms are balanced um, and the viscous compaction forces are small. And what happens in this case is that the drag, like the, the drag at the boundary of the melt channels, that's what limits how fast the melt can go. So one way to imagine this is that, well, there, uh, there is basically melt everywhere in the domain and the melt wants to move upwards and how fast it can move upwards that just depends on like the pathways it can take to the pores of the solid rock. Um, and this is something that's, that's similar to what would happen in the melting region below a mid-ocean ridge as long as you're somewhere down here. It's basically the melt flows almost vertically upwards and how fast it can go depends on the permeability and the viscosity of the melt. Um, but one other scenario is that the buoyancy is balanced by the viscous compaction forces and that the, the Darcy drag is small. And um, what happens in this case is that the buoyancy wants the melt to move upwards, but then uh, it needs to sort of, it, well, it needs to force open the cracks of the solid rock so that the melt can flow in. And this is the scenario that would, for example, be relevant at the top of a plume head um, where you have the, like the cold lithosphere on top of the plume where there is no melt um, the colder it is, the bigger the compaction viscosity. And sort of the, what needs to happen is if uh, the, the solid rock needs to sort of move apart for the melt to be able to flow in. And what can often happen in this scenario is that if the forces that are required to sort of open up the, the pores are really big, then the melt may just rise as, as a diapir where just like a lot of melt accumulates in one space and then um, moves upwards together with the solid instead of moving into the solid. Um, so those, those are sort of like two different limits of how the melt can move. Okay, and sort of these equations also define this length scale that I already talked about, the compaction length that determines 
like over which length scales the pressures in the model um, sort of respond to variations in fluid flux. Um, so that was this length scale I talked about earlier um, for that was relevant for picking the resolution. And so that depends on the bulk viscosity, the shear viscosity, the permeability, and the melt viscosity. And the other um, important parameter to think about for magma, magma dynamics is the phase separation flux. That's basically the porosity times the velocity difference between fluid and melt. And that, that's related to Darcy's law. So it depends on the permeability, the density difference between melt and solid, the gravity, and also the fluid viscosity. And so that's an estimate of the flux of melt relative to the solid. And so, yeah, so I had another example here. So that's maybe something that you can, you can play around with um, until tomorrow if, if you're interested in these melt models, because I don't think we have time to do this now. So my idea was we could also restart the model and we can change the compaction length. We can change it from the, uh, so we can change the shear and the bulk viscosity from the values that are there to those values. Um, and then restart the model and see how that would um, change the development of the model. But so since we, uh, since we are at this point, let's have a look at the model that we started earlier with the different permeability and look at how the permeability changed the model evolution. So, um, so if I go back to my para view, what I still have here is the original solution PVD of the first model that we ran. And I've changed the representation here to the melt velocity. And now what we want to do is we want to load in the output of the new model that we run. So I'm already in this rich restart directory. So if you haven't, uh, if you haven't gone there, so you may also be in the, in the mid ocean rich directory. Basically what you have to do is you have to navigate to the session four folder and then go to this directory that's called rich restart. And I was already there. So if you're already there, you just have to click on solution.pvd. And so if you, it will give you an additional error message if in your sort of in your animation view or in your time up there, if you're anywhere before the end of the model, because we've restarted the simulation, but we've, we've started from a checkpoint in a different folder. So, it, so this new model doesn't have any graphical output for the time before 8 million years. So what I will do is just, I will go to the last step that I have in my model and then click on apply. And so then for this new model that we have, we also want to look at the melt velocity. So we also want to go to the representation and change it to UF. And then we can compare the two and they sort of look different. So one thing I can do is just like remove the visibility here and show the other one. That's like the easiest comparison. And we see that for the new model that we ran, the, the colors are much darker. So it has now much bigger melt velocities. Uh, what we can also do is we can look at the model side by side. So if you uh, if you click at where this render view is, there is one button button that says split horizontally, where we can split the window to create a second view where we can oh should click into this window. If you if you then click into the window on the right, and then switch on the visibility of the new PVD. Um, then you will have the other model in the window on the yeah, in the window on the right. Let me just zoom in here. And then I kind of go, I can again go to the velocity. And so now we can compare these two models side by side. And so one thing that we can see is like this is the model, the model on the right is the one with the higher permeability. The model on the left is the one with the lower permeability. And so in the model of the higher permeability, it's both that everywhere in the domain, the melt moves faster, but it also has this channel here that's basically at the top of the melting region and at the base of the lithosphere, um, there's this channel where melt flows towards the ridge. Um, and it's much more pronounced in this model than in the other model. So what the permeability changes is not just the absolute velocity of the melt, but it also changes other features in the model. And so as there is not that much time left, 
um, I would say, so if you're interested in any uh, sort of in, in these MELT models, you can just go, go through the slides on your own. So I've, I have some other, um, so like, I have some slides about the methods where I explain how internally the MELT solver works. Also, if you have questions about, about this, I can also like answer them in the discussion. I also had some slides about the, like how the melting model works. And that's maybe also something that we can talk about in the discussion. And uh, one other thing I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show is sort of if you, if you want to continue to like play around with these melt models a bit um, before we start again tomorrow. Um, so there are other things that you could change. So one thing we said you could change is the permeability. That's what we just tried. The other thing that I, uh, where I have the example on the slide is changing the compaction length. So by changing the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity or compaction viscosity. Um, and they actually, so what I show here on the right are some images where people have published, well, how does it actually change the crustal thickness if we change some of these parameters? So the diamonds here are the observations and the, the colored lines are different models and they show that you really change the crustal thickness if you change, for example, the shear viscosity. Um, and the other thing that they have tried is they changed the spreading rate. So our half spreading rate is three centimeters per year and they use different values. And so that means you can compare to different mid-ocean ridges in the world um, and see if the spreading rate changes the crustal thickness. Um, yeah, and this one is where they changed the permeability and then got different crustal thicknesses. And so the, my, my second to last slide, there just are some ideas for how you could make the model more realistic. Um, I won't go through, go through all of them. I just want to say that basically um, just for like, just to be able to run the model quickly, this is like a big simplification compared to what people would use to run like models that they publish about the melting dynamics at mid ocean ridges. So for example, some of the simplifications are in this model, the viscosity does not depend on temperature. So that would be one thing to change to make it more realistic and reduce the temperature dependent rheology. Also, the model uses diffusion creep. And so introducing like dislocation creep or like a plastic rheology would make it more realistic. In reality, we would also have a topography on top of the mid-ocean ridge, right? We should have a bigger topography at the ridge axis. So it would be an idea to either add a free surface or to add a sticky air layer to, to be able to um, have this topography in the model. Um, then what, what happens in reality is not that we force at the top of the model to prescribe the plate velocity, but really what happens is that we should have a force on the side of the model and then the velocities should, like the plates should develop self consistently. So those, like this is another simplification in the model. Um, and then we, we made the heating model really simple. Um, so that's also something that, that would make the model more realistic. And then of course our melting parameterization is, is not really thermodynamically consistent. And so the last slide I wanted to show is, well, now that uh, sort of we, we've explained a lot of things, um, but if you have any more questions after this tutorial is over, where would you, would you go to, to get help about this? And so, well, in general, we've pointed you to the aspect manual that's always, uh, and to the parameter viewer, um, if you want to know something about a specific parameter or want to see a cookbook, that's all, always where you can have a look. Um, for the mouth models in particular, those are two publications that we wrote above uh, about how the magma dynamics in aspect works. So you can also have a look at those. But then if there are any other questions that where you would, uh, where you tried something in aspect and it didn't work and you need help with, um, where you can go is you can go to the aspect forum. So I've also posted the link here. Um, let me just click on that to open it in the browser. Um, so if you, if you follow that link, you will get to this, uh, you will get to the CIG forum. So the, the general forum uh, looks like this. It has like a lots of, like lots of different categories for different codes. Um, and there's one category for the aspect code. And so if you follow that link, you can see there are a lot of questions that other people have already asked. So they like uh, many people use aspect um, and so one thing you can do is you can go through the other posts and search if someone has already had a similar problem that you had and if someone has already answered that 
or you can of course just like open a new uh, open a new topic and ask a ask a new question and uh, generally like the the whole community is really friendly um, and we try to answer your question as quickly as possible so if you still have any questions after this tutorial ends you can always go to the forum and ask your questions there and so that was everything that I wanted to say. Um, we can discuss more um, in the discussion section, but I think uh, Menno also wanted to say something that, uh, so he wanted to make a short preparation for his tutorial about the world builder tomorrow. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so um, one thing I would like to ask you and let's see if can, I will need to be able to share my screen for this. Yes. So you should be able to do it now. Okay. Um, so you should now see my um, virtual machine. And one thing I would like to ask you to do now uh, or for tomorrow is to just go inside the aspect tutorial directory. You should already be there in a terminal. And um, do this command git pull origin master. Uh, I will type it in the chat. And um, what, this is what you should see uh, when you're doing that. Um, you should see that it's, it's doing something as it's adding some files. Um, so if you see that, uh, then you're good to go for tomorrow. Um, if you don't see that, uh, well, let us know uh, in the now or, or later in the discussion uh, today so we can fix any problems uh, you might encounter. That was it for me. All right, so I would say um, let's first take a 10 minute break or so and then come back for the discussion. And so you can ask any questions like either if this didn't work, we can help you with that. Or if you have any, still any questions about the, the melting models um, or anything else we did today or in the previous days, we can talk about that. Um, but I would say for now, let's just take a, uh, take a break and come back, let's say 15 minutes after the hour. So quarter past and for, uh, yeah, I guess for India, that would be 45 minutes after the hour. Um, and yeah, and I mean, of course, for those of you who don't have any questions, feel, uh, feel free to leave and we will see you all tomorrow again. Thank you all for, for participating.